Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's Siam Invited Address. We are very happy to have uh, Sunny Kanich from UC Berkeley. Uh, Sunny is a SIAM fellow, and uh, she, today she's going to talk to us about uh, about mathematical methods for biological fluid structure interactions. Here, Sunny, thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation uh, to come here and give, give this Siam lecture. Uh, what I would like to do today is to give uh, uh, an overview of the mathematical methods that we have been developing to study fluid structure interaction uh, between the flow of incompressible viscous fluids, such as water or blood, for example, and uh, various types of structures, elastic, viscoelastic, composite, mesh-supported structures, such as, for example, arterial walls. Our techniques apply to a larger class of problems, but my main motivation comes from studying uh, problems motivated by cardiovascular applications. Um, and the word biological fluid structure interaction in the title here is because, uh, as you will see in the talk, uh, there is an additional difficulty uh, imposed uh, uh, in studying fluid structure interaction with incompressible fluids in the case uh, when the density of the structure and the density of the fluid are comparable. This is particularly visible in designing different kinds of uh, partitioned, loosely coupled schemes, and uh, in, uh, in the, the problems also become evident in the existence proofs, in the constructive existence proofs uh, that I will show you a little bit later in today's talk. So this is a joint work uh, with... Uh, uh, several collaborators, a uh, few mathematicians uh, that are listed here on the slide, uh, and then also experts uh, in biology and medicine. Uh, most of the research that I will be reporting on today was done together with Drs. David Paniagua and David Fish from the Texas Heart Institute, and then I will say a couple of words about the most recent work uh, together with Professors Desai, the chair of the bioengineering department at UCSF, and the Shuvo Roy, uh, Desai works, uh, on nanoengineered stents, and the Shuvo Roy on the design of a bioartificial pancreas for, uh, uh, diabetic patients. Uh, their office is just across from the bay, right here. This is the view from my office at UC Berkeley. <laughs> So um, let me start by first uh, giving you an example of the application that I have in mind related to stent-based uh, uh, treatment of coronary artery disease. And then in the two-thirds of the rest of the talk, I will be talking about the um, methods for the existence proof of weak solutions to this class of problems. So uh, coronary artery disease is associated with the closure or occlusion of uh, coronary arteries. Uh, coronary arteries sit on the surface of the heart and are the main supply of blood to the heart muscle and food to the heart muscle. So occlusion or closure of a coronary artery um, is a precursor for heart attack or starvation of the heart muscle downstream from the occluded area, uh, which uh, is, of course, can be deadly. So it's in an interest to treat this, and one way to uh, treat is, um, this condition is non-surgically, uh, using a um, catheter or angioplasty with stenting. The catheter is inserted in the groin area, or nowadays most recently in the radial artery in the arm, and guided to the location um, in the heart uh, that is diseased to the lesion location. Uh, the balloon is inflated. That pushes the plaque deposits against the walls of the native artery. 
And then uh, sometimes a stent is placed. This is a, a balloon expandable stent. There are different types of stents. This metallic mesh-like tube uh, is expanded with the balloon expansion and the left they are anchored to uh, keep uh, or support the arterial walls and provide normal blood supply to the heart muscle. There are several generations of stents uh, developed uh, so far. Uh, the whole field from the medical point of view uh, related to stents uh, started in the late 1980s where the first generation of stents, the so-called bare metal stents, were developed and used to treat this uh, uh, condition. But uh, uh, so the idea was that the stents would reduce the complication that was uh, typically associated with balloon angioplasty alone without the use of stents, uh, which is restenosis uh, or reclosure of the diseased coronary artery in a certain number of patients. So bare metal stents indeed reduced the restenosis rates, but uh, were then later associated with uh, complications that are typically uh, uh, caused by the damage to the arterial wall, the different layers of the arterial wall, the innermost uh, uh, endothelial cells or the smooth muscle cells in the medial layer. So to even further reduce uh, the restenosis rates, the second generation of stents was uh, introduced, the so-called drug-eluting stents. This was in the 2000s. These are the stents whose stent struts are actually covered, aligned with a polymer uh, that contains an anti-proliferative drug, which uh, prevents pro proliferation of smooth muscle cells into the lumen of the artery and lowers the restenosis rate. But these stents were then, six years later, uh, associated with a different complication, which is called the late-stage stent thrombosis, which is typically associated with the inflammation uh, uh, caused by the polymer or some of the anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, this is the state of the art today, namely if you were to have a coronary angioplasty with stenting, you would probably be treated with one of the drug-eluting stents. So to further improve the uh, performance uh, of stents in coronary angioplasty, uh, several other directions have been taken. One is uh, to use polymer-free nanoparticle-based drug delivery, which consists of lining a stent or filling the stent struts with nanoparticles that are used to deliver uh, these anti-proliferative uh, drugs to the tissue. Or, and this is something that Dr. Desai has been doing, uh, engineer or produce nano-engineered stents, which are simply so there is no drug there. These uh, stent struts are lined by these nano-engineered grown titanium dioxide nanotubes uh, which give rise, titanium dioxide is a, is a powder which is actually used also in uh, toothpaste uh, for food coloring in makeup and so on. So they can actually grow nanotubes uh, from titanium dioxide that cover the stent surface and give rise to this uh, nano-structured uh, uh, surface of the stent, which has been shown to actually promote and accelerate uh, the restoration and growth of function and, uh, functional endothelium uh, and actually uh, keep uh, stents patent uh, longer time. Uh, there is quite a lot of literature in this area from the mathematical point of view. Uh, I would say that the activity started uh, around 2004 uh, and there are various issues discussed uh, based on modeling and analysis related to fluid structure interaction, mechanical properties of stents, biodegradable uh, polymers, uh, advection reaction diffusion equation for drugs in the tissue, and so on. But uh, what I would like to talk about today is something that is common to all of the topics that I just mentioned, and this is to understand uh, the fluid structure interaction between, oops, uh, the flow of an incompressible viscous fluid such as blood 
and let's say a stented artery uh, and its influence on the surrounding tissue and on the local and global blood flow. So we are going to talk uh, about FSI uh, between, uh, again, the flow of an incompressible viscous fluid, elastic or viscoelastic structures, multi-layered composite structures. So arterial walls are composed of several different layers, each with different mechanical characteristics and thickness. Mesh-supported composite structures such as stents supporting the arterial wall. And uh, in the case of studying advection diffusion reaction through the tissue, vascular tissue, poroelastic mesh-supported composite structures. So the area, uh, this last uh, area in particular, is still quite open. Uh, there are still open questions about what are the physically reasonable coupling conditions between the flow and the poroelastic BO models. There are some recent thin shell and membrane BO poroelastic models uh, that have been proposed uh, and rigorously mathematically justified that can be used, for example, to couple and form a composite multi-layered vascular wall uh, interacting with uh, blood. So um, let me go to the modeling and analysis point of view. Uh, and again, what we are interested in here is the following. So we have a fluid uh, coming from the right to the left for some strange reason today, uh, interacting with the elastic structure. Uh, so exerting a contact force traction to the structure, uh, which gets expanded, uh, and then the potential elastic energy gets released as the structure squeezes the fluid and pushes it, move, uh, pushes it even further forward. The uh, models that we will be using uh, are for the fluid, the uh, Navier-Stokes equations for an incompressible viscous fluid. U is the fluid velocity. Uh, sigma is the Cauchy stress tensor. The first uh, set of equations, vector equation, describes the balance of momentum. Uh, the second one, divergence of U is equal to zero, the conservation principle for an incompressible viscous fluid. Uh, and so uh, we will be assuming for the purposes of this talk that our fluid is Newtonian, which blood is not, uh, but in medium to large arteries, the particular rheology of blood, uh, depending on what kind of questions are you trying to answer, uh, is not as important. So a Newtonian approximation is a good one, uh, which means that sigma is related to the fluid velocity and pressure via this relationship where D is the symmetrized gradient of the velocity. So we have two parameters in the problem, the fluid density and the fluid viscosity, UF. The thick structure will be modeled in this talk for the purposes of this talk as a linearly elastic structure. So I will have the fluid and my composite structure, which consists of two layers, the thin layer, which is shown in black here, elastic corresponding to the intima, the, the innermost layer in the vascular walls, and the thick layer corresponding to the media and adventitia complex in vascular walls, modeled using, for the purposes of this talk, uh, linear elasticity. D here, so let me go back for just a second before I continue here to let you know that uh, these equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, are defined on a moving domain. And this is one of the main difficulties in studying this problem, both from the computational and analysis point of view. Uh, the domain depends on time, as I was showing here uh, earlier. Uh, and not only that, uh, it is... Um, it is not known a priori uh, because it depends on the solution of the whole problem. Uh, in contrast, however, the uh, structure equations are defined on a fixed do reference domain, the so-called Lagrangian formulation, uh, which is, uh, in this case, a straight cylinder, omega s. Uh, and so I have my structure equations uh, defined. So d here is the displacement from the reference configuration, omega s. And so I have my structure equations defined in uh, the fixed domain, 
where S is the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor for linearly elastic uh, structure is given by this relation uh, where mu and lambda are the Lamé coefficients of elasticity describing the elastic properties of that uh, structure. The thin structure uh, whose current location we will be denoting by gamma of t uh, will be modeled using uh, the um, thin structure reduced models of shell or membrane. Uh, so, for example, a general form these models take uh, is this. If I denote by eta uh, the displacement from the reference configuration gamma, uh, which uh, is just uh, this uh, straight cylinder, uh, then um, uh, I have a, the shell density rho k, k is for coiter, h is the thickness. I have mass times acceleration uh, plus the sum of forces coming from the elastic energy of the structure uh, is balanced by the forces acting on the thin structure. Uh, for the purposes of our proof, uh, Le is going to be a continuous linear coercive operator on H02 of gamma. Actually, we have now proofs when L uh, is also a nonlinear operator, describing nonlinear coiter shell. The question now is to see how to couple these different models. Uh, and so one needs to prescribe two sets of coupling conditions to give rise to a well-defined uh, problem. One is the kinematic conditions describing the kinematic coupling of kinematic quantities such as velocity. We will be using the no-slip condition. The velocity of the fluid, the trace of the fluid velocity on the gamma of T on the current location of the interface is equal to the velocity on the, of the interface itself. Uh, this uh, here uh, really is a composite function between the velocity u and the mapping the, which maps the current configuration gamma of t onto, some, onto a fixed reference configuration. Numerically, this will correspond to the ALE arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian mapping. So we have a geometric nonlinearity here. And we also have a no-slip condition between the thin and thick structure, namely the velocity of the thick structure, the trace at the interface is equal to the velocity of the interface itself. And the dynamic coupling condition, which describes the balance of forces, which says that the interface, the thin structure, the interface with mass, is driven by the jump in the normal stress between the fluid on one side and the thick structure on the other. This is where the nonlinear coupling comes into play, and this geometric nonlinearity is one of the main difficulties uh, in uh, the, uh, to study the underlying problem. Just very briefly here to uh, show that this model makes sense from the energy point of view, namely that there is no spurious energy generated that is not due to the energy generated by the, by the inlet and outlet or initial data. One can formally get the following energy estimate, that the rate of change of the kinetic energy of the fluid, thin and thick structure, plus the elastic energy of the thin and thick structure, plus the viscous dissipation of the fluid due to the fluid viscosity are bounded entirely by the inlet and outlet uh, um, pressure data. My initial data here is zero. Uh, so our problem going back to this will be driven uh, by the inlet and outlet pressure data. Uh, just very quickly here, uh, uh, what we consider a weak solution, so motivated by that energy estimate, our weak solution is the, the following triple, uh, the fluid velocity, thin structure displacement, and thick structure displacement belonging to these spaces, uh, which are typical spaces that you would expect for the fluid, for people who work in this area, uh, for the coiter shell, so a fourth order derivative with respect to space, second order uh, with respect to time, and for the thick structure, uh, second order derivative with respect to time, uh, Vs is H1 here, so second order derivative with respect to space with the kinematic coupling condition embedded in the weak solution space. 
Now, um, why weak solutions? Well, of course, in certain cases, you can uh, work uh, on uh, trying to prove the existence of stronger solutions, more regular solutions than what I just showed here. But in the case of a stent, so this is a little simulation uh, that shows you what the solution looks like for uh, four different types of uh, stents. Uh, one can see that there are some singularities in the solution, in the displacement of the structure, that uh, based on which we actually do not expect in these cases to obtain uh, existence of solutions that are stronger than the weak solutions themselves. This is a little movie showing also uh, formation of uh, singularities. Uh, we have a pressure wave coming from the left. Uh, it hits the region where the stent is located. This is not physiological data. The displacement is exaggerated. You don't see this in your cardiovascular system. Um, so you have a pressure wave generated at the, on the left hitting the stent. A part of the wave is transmitted and travels through the stent, and the part is reflected and goes backwards uh, to the left side, to the um, uh, inlet portion. And then we have uh, uh, reflected waves bouncing, uh, bouncing back and forth uh, in this region. So the uh, literature on studying fluid, st uh, fluid structure interaction from the mathematical existence and analysis point of view uh, started around 1999. Uh, the first uh, results came uh, by Desjardins and Esteban uh, that were considering uh, the fluid structure interaction between rigid solids immersed in the fluid uh, or bodies described by a finite number of model functions. Uh, and then uh, in 2003, uh, do Gansberger, Howe, and Lee uh, uh, analyzed the problem related to fluid structure interaction with elastic solids, but uh, on a fixed uh, fluid domain, the so-called linear coupling. And then uh, in 2004, Beriada Vega published the uh, first result in which FSI with elastic visco or viscoelastic solids uh, was discussed uh, on a moving domain with that nonlinear coupling that I showed you on the previous uh, slide. So the uh, solid and the fluid motion are coupled uh, across the current moving uh, interface. There are two sets of results in this area. One is related to the existence of strong and the other weak solutions. Typically, the existence of strong solutions is for a short time or, or, or small data, and weak solutions globally in time or until there is some kind of degeneracy in the fluid domain. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where I want to continue in this talk and uh, give you an overview of uh, our uh, let's say, uh, uh, tools or technology that we have developed uh, to study uh, with uh, the existence of weak solutions uh, with a constructive proof. Okay, so we uh, can write our couple, the fluid structure interaction problem, is a first order system in time, du dt is equal to a times u, on some time interval from zero to capital T with some initial data, uh, where A here is a, um, in general, nonlinear positive continuous operator. The difficulty here is that uh, because our domains uh, depend on time, uh, the solution spaces V also depend on time, and so these operators A will depend on time as a parameter through their definition uh, on the different solution spaces, uh, function spaces V of T. Um, so what we would like to do is to address the questions of existence of weak solutions to this problem by using uh, the so-called Roth's method, uh, which is based uh, on semi-discretizing our original problem with respect to time. So we subdivide our time interval from zero to t into n sub intervals. 
and on each uh, sub-interval of Tn, Tn plus 1, solve this, uh, let's say, backwards Euler-based uh, Euler uh, time discretization of the original uh, problem, defined on a given now uh, domain omega n associated with the time discretization delta t. Uh, so we will, this uh, scheme gives rise to a set of uh, functions of x only uh, defined for each uh, fixed uh, tn here. And so we can extend those functions to the whole time interval, let's say by a piecewise constant extension, and obtain a function uh, u delta t as a function of t uh, defined uh, that way. So what we would like to show is that this uh, sequence of functions, u delta t, um, has a subsequence which converges as delta t goes to zero to a weak solution of the original coupled uh, problem. The first uh, person who, uh, well, to the best of my knowledge, uh, used uh, this type of approach, Roth's method, to study existence of solutions to a moving boundary problem was Ladyzhinskaya in the 1970s, uh, where she actually studied the incompressible Navier-Stokes uh, equations defined on a moving, given moving domain. The motion of the domain was a smooth C2 function. And uh, she showed uh, uh, the existence of a strong solution locally in time and for small data. Our main difficulty really here is the fact that we don't know uh, the uh, regularity or the position of the boundary of the fluid domain a priori, and this is something that we need to deal with uh, in uh, this coupled FSI problem. So, again, the main difficulties are related to the fact that this is a moving domain, that we have a multi-physics problem. We have to couple uh, the fluid flow, which is a parabolic system of PDEs, with the uh, hyperbolic uh, PDEs describing rate propagation in the structure. These uh, have two different uh, scalings, and so one has to uh, relate the two in some way uh, to obtain a uh, the existence and then uh, uh, convergence to a uh, weak solution of the coupled problem. And since the problem is nonlinear, we need compactness arguments to actually be able to show that our subsequence converges to a weak solution, pass with the limit under the integral sign that defines weak solutions, uh, to be able to show that the limit satisfies the original PDE. And so we deal with this first issue by actually mapping. It's a combination of approaches, uh, but we can map things onto a fixed domain or on the current domain by a certain mapping uh, that corresponds to the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian mapping that people have been using in numerics. Uh, to deal with uh, the multi-physics nature of the problem, uh, we will time discretize our original problem by separating the fluid from the structure sub-problems, uh, deal with these two separately in some way, and then couple the two in the compactness arguments uh, that will show convergence to the, couple, to the solution of the coupled problem. So with Boris Muha, uh, we actually recently have obtained the general compactness arguments, a generalization of the Aubin Lyons Simon compactness lemma to problems on moving domains, uh, which we were able to use. So this is going to appear in JDE uh, in 2019. It's in print. Uh, that we were able to use uh, for a large class of these types of fluid structure interaction problems. And I'm going to say more about that in just a second. So let me show you how do we split uh, the fluid uh, from structure sub-problems first. So we have, again, we start with our coupled uh, problem. Uh, and we will uh, write, it, uh, write our coupled operator A as the sum, non-trivial sum of two n in general uh, operators A1 and A2. One will correspond to the fluid and one to the structure subproblem. And then on each subinterval, we would solve the fluid problem 
with the initial data obtained from the previous time step, that's the information from the structure that I have uh, just uh, solved from the previous time step, and then I will so solve my structure subproblem with the initial data given at Tn, uh, obtained from the just calculated the fluid subproblem. So these two fluid and structure subproblems communicate uh, only via the initial data. It's a weak coupling. There is a, a, a quite a large uh, time discretization error, uh, a, a splitting error, sorry. Uh, a modification of this approach gives rise to a numerical scheme with higher accuracy, but for the existence proof, this is sufficient. So the question is, when I start with the original problem, which is written here again, I have my fluid equations, my fixed structure equation, and the coupling conditions at the interface. How do I split this into a fluid problem with some boundary conditions at the interface and the structure subproblem with some boundary conditions at the interface so that as my delta t goes to zero, I get convergence to a weak solution? Not every splitting will do this. <clears throat> and so to motivate why we chose a certain splitting, namely what I need to tell you now is how am I going to split this boundary data, a piece of which will go uh, together with the fluid equation and the piece together with the structure equation. So how am I going to split this so that I get a convergent stable and convergent scheme. And for that, I'll show you an experiment. <clears throat> so I would like to motivate the splitting by looking at this uh, relatively simple uh, spring mass system. So what do we have here? So we have this uh, spring mass system oscillating in air and uh, in water. And you immediately see a difference in the solution, of course. Uh, one is, of course, that the amplitude of the oscillations here uh, stays uh, large, so there is a decrease in amplitude here. But also, if I restart this, you will see, oopsie, that the frequency of uh, oscillations for the uh, system in water is smaller than the frequency of oscillations in air something, of course, that we would expect. So uh, if you measure uh, the height of the center of mass of the weight uh, and plot it against time, uh, then you see, of course, uh, something which looks like this. This is the behavior in air, and blue is the behavior in water. You see that you have a frequency of oscillations in water, which is slightly larger than in air. And if you try to solve this uh, system, so this is a simple under-damped uh, oscillator, uh, you will get your solution, which looks like this is a function of time. When the uh, constant uh, of elasticity for the spring is larger than uh, uh, C here, which is a viscoelasticity coefficient associated, as I would like to convince you, with viscosity of water, and which is usually the case in our applications, then the predominant reason for the amplitude decrease is the viscoelastic behavior of the spring, the water viscoelasticity, which I would like to show you how that appears here in a second. And the predominant uh, reason for changing the frequency of oscillations is, if you look at this, if you increase your mass uh, then you will have that your frequency of oscillations is smaller. So how is that uh, related to our original problem? So this is something that, of course, engineers have used and have known and have used in the design of the computational schemes long time ago, 40 years ago, in fact, uh, as the added mass effect. The um, issue here is that, let me go back for just a second, uh, that as this uh, weight oscillates, uh, that it has to, as it oscillates, displace a certain mass of fluid uh, on both sides and, and use a, a certain energy to actually do that. 
Uh, and the, so the oscillations is the rate, uh, if the ratio between the density of the elastic spring mass system is the density of the weight and the density of the fluid is, if gets closer, the ratio becomes smaller, the weight feels uh, the fluid much more than in the case when the ratio, to, ratio between the two densities is larger. And so, as I said, let me remind you, in biofluids, uh, we will have that our vascular tissue, which uh, should replace this weight, uh, actually mass spring system, has density which is roughly the same as the density of blood around it. And so, as it moves, it will feel much more the mass of the blood around it, uh, around it. Uh, and so we will have this added mass effect in the system related to the blood flow applications much more pronounced. Well, it turns out that, that actually how you treat this added mass effect uh, uh, gives rise to that the stability of your computational scheme depends on how you treat the, the uh, added mass uh, effect. Namely, if I, uh, re if I rewrite uh, my simple oscillator equation and separate uh, the structure from the fluid mass, uh, then, of course, I have something which looks like this. Uh, forget about the viscous effect for just a second because I want to focus now on the added mass effect uh, only. And if I uh, uh, discretize this problem in time, in such a way that uh, I am using my simple uh, finite difference at time n plus 1 to discretize the acceleration associated with the inertia of the structure. And uh, at time n, I will discretize so explicitly uh, the acceleration associated with the inertia of the fluid. And uh, so I keep the two uh, inertia explicitly uh, coupled. And if I look at the stability of this uh, scheme uh, by writing the corresponding characteristic polynomial, uh, chi as a function of s, I get a third order polynomial. And I can show that, of course, uh, by plugging negative infinity, that as s goes to negative infinity, chi will approach negative infinity, uh, and uh, by plugging in negative one, uh, I can see that this is the expression that uh, when mf is greater than ms, the fluid mass is greater than the structure mass, uh, this is going to be positive. So there has to exist a root as a, a star, whose absolute value is uh, strictly greater than one. And so I will have uh, instability for any delta t in the case when the mass of the displaced fluid is greater than or equal to the mass uh, of the structure itself. Uh, or namely, I, if I just rewrite this in terms of density and volume, I get that if the ratio between the fluid density and structure density times this volume ratio is strictly uh, is greater than or equal to one, we definitely, we have unconditionally unstable scheme. This is related to how we want to split our original problem. Oh, but first let me show you this little movie uh, which uses uh, an implicit uh, monolithic scheme to study fluid structure interaction. And here, uh, an explicit scheme, the Dirichlet-Neumann scheme, you see that you get uh, instability and no control over high frequency oscillations. Uh, we said that the added mass effect is uh, associated with uh, lower frequency in oscillations. No control over high frequency oscillations uh, uh, in the numerical scheme. And in fact, uh, Gerbeau, Kauzin, Gerbeau, and Nobile in 2005 uh, on a slightly more involving uh, example showed uh, how this added mistreatment uh, of this added mass effect uh, gives rise to uh, unconditionally unstable schemes in the case when the fluid and structure densities are close to each other. Uh, and that result in 2006 uh, sparked again 
quite a lot of activity in the area of designing partitioned loosely coupled schemes. Um, one of the approaches is our approach, which I'm going to show you now. Uh, so again, uh, I have my uh, fluid and uh, thick structure equations, but as we just saw, I would like to keep in an implicit way the fluid inertia with uh, my structure inertia. So I would like to have for my boundary condition for the fluid sub problem, a condition which will involve this term together with my fluid inertia term. And indeed, I can use my kinematic coupling condition, which tells me that C here is equal to d eta dt, which is equal to the trace of u and gamma. So I can replace C by u and then use that, think of C as being u, plus the other term which involves the trace of u and gamma as my Robin type boundary condition for my fluid sub problem. And then I will use whatever is left as my boundary condition for the structure. I will do a similar trick and the structure will then consist uh, of the inertia term, the linearly elastic term, and the uh, first the stress term as in uh, the, the trace of it on gamma. So I have my scheme now which looks like this. Uh, given a fluid domain and the fluid velocity, structure velocity, and thick structure displacement, this is interface velocity, uh, I am going to solve my uh, fluid sub-problem with that Robin type of boundary condition. Uh, then I will use this, a solution of this, as my initial data for the thick structure sub-problem uh, with the boundary condition that I just showed you. Uh, I will then update my structure location and obtain my new fluid domain and then repeat. Again, this algorithm has only square root of delta t accuracy, uh, which is suboptimal. Modifications of this computationally have been done by our group and Martina Bukaj that give rise to the accuracy delta t and now even delta t squared. So, yes, the main reason why this is stable again uh, is because we have implicitly kept the fluid and the structure inertia together. How is this reflected in the proof? Well, we, uh, because of the way we kept the fluid and structure inertia uh, implicitly, we can actually, in our energy estimates, uniform energy estimates, obtain an estimate which in it, so this is the kinetic energy, which in it contains also the kinetic energy of the interface. If we were keeping, if we were to keep the fluid and structure inertia explicitly coupled, we would not have been able to obtain an estimate on the kinetic energy of the thin uh, fluid structure interface and would not be able to keep it uh, under control uh, as uh, delta t goes to zero. So the general existence, I'm almost done, uh, proof of the main ideas are uh, that we obtain, because of the uh, way how we dealt with the added mass effect, uh, we obtain these uniform in delta T energy estimates for both sub-problems. Uh, this gives rise to the existence of weekly or weekly star convergent subsequences in the corresponding topologies. Uh, then this is again a nonlinear problem to pass to the limit and get existence of weak solution. We need the compactness argument. Uh, and then we get, uh, uh, we would get strong convergence in L2, L2 of the fluid and structure velocities and get the convergence to a weak solution of a subsequence to a weak solution of the coupled problem. So to argue why is this going to be a compact uh, uh, operator, a compact problem. Let me go back again to the, the same experiment um, and uh, uh, argue or show you how uh, directly fu fluid viscosity comes into play uh, in smoothing things out uh, uh, when, in case when the weight is uh, 
uh, immersed in water. So, so fluid water viscosity plays out a role. Uh, so again, uh, I would like to associate uh, my fluid viscosity uh, with this uh, viscoelastic term uh, in, the, in the damped oscillator. Um, I will show you here using hand-waving arguments uh, that this term here uh, really comes from the fluid structure coupling and has the form of a square root of the negative Laplacian uh, times the fluid viscosity uh, coefficient, namely a fractional uh, differential operator acting on the time derivative of the structure displacement, the structure velocity. And to do that, uh, I'm going to, uh, we can look at the Dirichlet-Neumann operator, which uh, is an operator uh, that associates, so let's look at this simple problem, uh, Laplace of u is equal to zero in the upper half plane with some Dirichlet data on gamma. Um, and what I want to do is to associate to that Dirichlet data, F, the Neumann data of the solution of this problem. So uh, my operator, do I have it here? Yes. Uh, let's say T, uh, the Dirichlet Neumann operator, will associate to my F uh, the uh, UI, the Y derivative uh, of U on gamma. Uh, and uh, if I do whatever, a very simple calculation, um, apply this operator twice, uh, so I have T of uh, negative U gamma, uh, I get uh, UYY, use the PDE, get the negative U, uh, I mean, Laplace operator with respect to X of F, uh, and take the square root here, I get indeed that T is the, to determine the sign, I have to use the weak formulation and show that the operator is positive, which indeed is. So T is the square root of the negative Laplacian. And so if I go back to my original problem uh, and ignore, again, I said this is a hand-waving argument, uh, the terms that are not related to fluid viscosity, and look at the equation negative mu Laplace of U is equal to zero, with my kinematic and the dynamic coupling condition with the structure, uh, then I have my Dirichlet data U here, given by D eta DT, and the structure which is driven by uh, by uh, in the case when I ignore the, the other terms by the Neumann data obtained. So this is like DU DN. Uh, obtained uh, after calculating the solution, uh, so to speak, of my uh, Dirichlet data problem for the Laplacian, uh, Laplace of U is equal to zero. And so as we just argued here, uh, this really behaves like uh, um, U times the square root uh, of the negative Laplacian operator uh, applied to my Dirichlet data, which is D eta DT. So the structure in this case fills the fluid uh, through this uh, fractional uh, differential operator coming from the fluid viscosity uh, and acting on the structure uh, velocity. Um, and so, of course, things are much more involving uh, for the full problem. We have a compactness result uh, which looks something like this, which I'm going to have to skip for the purposes of this talk. Uh, and um, uh, get a compactness result, which says that both the fluid and structure velocities are, are in L2, L2, which gives rise to the existence of a weak solution to the original problem, which satisfies uh, that uh, energy estimate that I showed you earlier. And um, we applied this to problems uh, uh, consisting of only one layer of coiter, linear and nonlinear coiter shell, uh, multi-layered structures, uh, Navier slip boundary condition, 
the presence of vascular stents modeled by jump co coefficients in the uh, coiter shell equations. And now we are actually uh, have a result where we have modeled our stent as a hyperbolic net uh, coupled to the shell equations in the fluid. Uh, and we first had the linear coupling result and now are finishing the full nonlinear coupling result. Uh, we used uh, our methodology to design a computational scheme to study, do I have two minutes? Two. <laughs> to study the performance of four different stents uh, as they were inserted in uh, curved uh, coronary arteries. This was something that we were asked to do by our collaborators, uh, Dr. David Paniago and David Fish. Uh, so... Uh, we wanted to, so what we used was a fluid structure interaction with pulse tile data at the inlet and outlet of our tube, but also took into account the contraction of the heart muscle. Um, we modeled our wall as a multi-layered structure, and the presence of a stent in this case was modeled just by changing the stiffness of the uh, elasticity coefficients and the thickness and the and the thickness at the location of the stent uh, struts. Uh, and one can see, uh, for example, uh, uh, results here showing just the uh, interface um, without the fixed structure on the outer side. Uh, and if you zoom in, as you already saw, you see different types of behavior that may be associated with uh, injury and inflammatory response and risk stenosis. Uh, we also calculated the so-called von Mises stress, which is associated with maximal distortion of the tissue uh, in the medial layer. Uh, and if you stop this at a certain point for those four different stents, uh, and in fact uh, compare with numbers, I don't have that graph, uh, you can see from these pictures uh, that in fact, so red is a high deviation from normal values of uh, uh, von Mises stress, actually Palmas stent is associated with the values which are three times higher than the normal values of von Mises stress in the tissue, uh, then you can associate uh, this uh, stretching of the media layer, uh, which be, uh, results in bioengineering literature show that this is associated uh, uh, with injury, neointimal hyperplasia, and development of risk stenosis. Uh, and one can see from the simulations that the best performing stent uh, is this uh, cipher uh, stent. And then because of the multi-layer, the structure of, that we have taken into account, we could also look at the uh, stresses experienced by the intimal layer, the innermost layer, the thin layer, the interface directly in contact with blood flow, uh, and they actually showed, so red here, shows excessive uh, elastic deformation, and blue is resistance to deformation. And one can also argue, again, that to make a long story short, that cipher stent, uh, in fact, uh, performs the best uh, in this scenario. Uh, there are various conclusions that can be drawn from here. Uh, uh, but also this approach can be used, uh, and we have used this uh, for a design of a stent uh, for the so-called transcatheter aortic valve replacement procedure, which has been patented and now used in patients. And this is at the University of Maryland, the largest stent that I have seen. We exhibit in the hallway of their bioengineering building. This is Cypher. It says implanted in over 2 million patients and known for its flexibility. Thank you.